found me in a deep hole in the ground, covered with large, dried banana leaves. It was a hiding place unfit for any human being. I remember thinking it was too small for a grown woman like myself. When they found me, they pulled me out of the hole and gently began to pick the bugs out of my clothes and my hair. Nitwa Bernadette, my name is Bernadette, I said. Seeing their faces made me cry. They were the first faces I had seen in over one month of hiding. This is the story of Bernadette, a woman I interviewed during my fifth research trip to Rwanda. Bernadette was almost killed simply because she was a Tutsi, a member of a persecuted group during the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. I remember that day. The sun had passed its noon position, providing some welcome relief from the heat that accompanied me on the hour-long bus ride to Niamata Memorial Church, where I met Bernadette, who was a caretaker there. We sat barefoot on the grass for the interview, the mass graves behind us, cold slabs of stone hiding the caskets and bones strewn underneath. Each day as a caretaker, Bernadette would tend to the caskets and clean the bones for preservation. And she was also in charge of beautification of the site, of planting flowers to show visitors that life was still worth living, even after the genocide. That was my first sense of dignity when they picked the bugs out of my clothes and my hair, Bernadette said. That was the first sense of justice, the human decency they treated me with in a moment of terror and uncertainty. Bernadette didn't seem to mind interviewing with me, as it was a welcome break from her physical work at the site. Although it was a different kind of work, it was emotional work to speak with me. She didn't seem to mind. Most visitors ignored Bernadette, as they considered her to be just a janitor. Most visitors never spoke to Bernadette, and they didn't know that she was a survivor. The community in Rwanda was torn apart 21 years ago, in 1994, when the genocide against the Tutsi ravaged the country. In just about 100 days, nearly 800,000 innocent individuals were killed. I sat in the living room of Joseph, a man who I met through San Fami Church, so it wasn't a surprise to me that Christian relics lined the wall. And Joseph candidly spoke to me about his experience with genocide as total deception. Joseph had escaped the killers over five times. He was constantly on the run, hiding and bribing officials. But when the first massacres happened in his diverse Kigali city neighborhood, he referred to this as total deception. You see, he had Hutu neighbors who he had shared good things with, like school carpools and birthday parties. And he had shared bad things with them, like power outages and prior violence in the city. But it was these neighbors who took part in the killings, and this for him was total deception. We ended the interview again with his feelings of total deception of the genocide. As a PhD student who researches, researches memory and justice in Rwanda, I was intrigued by stories like these. Like many of you, I knew about the horrors that occurred during the genocide, but that didn't take away the shock when I traveled to the country, interviewed these survivors, and learned about the physical and emotional scars that they bear. I was just as shocked to learn that one of the interviewees, he stood up abruptly, lifted his shirt, and showed me the machete cut strewn across his stomach. Showing me the physical scar was an act of dignity and defiance for him. He looked fine above his clothes, but underneath, he bared this physical scar. I'm not fine, the scar said but one day I hope to be. I was just as shocked to learn that my best friend in Rwanda, one of my best friends, was blind in one eye due to a cut on his head by the Interhamway, the genocidal militia, when he was only five years old. I remember sitting in a local bar with him, drinking Fanta Citron, Lemon Fanta, which is our favorite soda, and uh, something compelled me to reach out and to touch the scar above his eye, the rough slit of skin between my fingers. We were both really uncomfortable in that moment because that scar represented 
his emotional duress juxtaposed with his own strength to survive. He told me he was really uncomfortable in that moment, but it was okay, I could touch the scar because of my work, because of what I did with, uh, because of my interviews with genocide survivors and learning about justice. And that emotional and physical closeness was important to me because touching the scar allowed me to relate to and imagine those scars that I could not touch. So these experiences have led me to ask, how can we help a society recover after such a genocide? And one answer is access to justice. But justice in the ordinary sense, in the legal sense, is not enough. Justice in the ordinary sense is often insufficient for these survivors. Let me explain to you what I mean. Justice in the ordinary and legal sense focuses on perpetrators and punishment while justice in the symbolic sense focuses on victims and survivors and focuses on empathy, validation, and listening to local voices. We don't have to have survived a genocide to know that these types of symbolic justice are just as important to us as human beings. So who are these survivors and what do they do to remember and to access justice in the aftermath of the genocide? This past June, I remember I stepped onto a bus where 20 survivors awaited me. And while they were roughly all the same age, about 30 years old, Bona was introduced to me as the mother of this family and Felix as the father. I learned that they were members of an IRJ family from the Association of Students and Genocide Survivors. They were an artificial family created to help young people come together and recover and reintegrate after the genocide. The survivors were excited to have me. I was new and different, and they hoped that I would think positively of their work with the genocide commemoration we were about to experience. We connected on the most basic level because we had all decided to spend our weekend at a genocide commemoration. The bus took off, and we left the smoggy city center of Kigali and arrived in the rolling hills of Rwanda, those beautiful green hills that some of you have seen pictures of. Women were carrying baskets on their head. They were walking along the road, and they were wearing traditional gitenge, local African fabric, like the fabric that my dress is made of. And an hour and a half later, we arrived in Kinazi, where the overnight commemoration would take place. And I kid you not, there were 2,000 Rwandans standing over the mass grave at the memorial site. And these 2,000 Rwandans, including us, were there to commemorate those who were completely wiped out during the genocide, who had nobody to remember them. When I got there, I pushed my way to the front. I said, I had to see what's going on. What are all these people looking at? And as I got to the front, I saw my friends, the family from the bus, carrying seven caskets toward the mass graves. These victims' bodies had been found that year in that place, and they were being buried at the commemoration today. We then all gathered in a white tent and listened to stories, to poems, to songs, to testimonies, and to prayers until the sun rose. And when the first rays of sunlight came into our tent, there was a sigh of relief among the mourners. They had done it again. They had remembered. And in remembering, they had provided decency and justice to those who had been completely wiped out during the genocide. The Kinazi commemoration took place during my second week in Rwanda this summer. And when I got back on that Sunday afternoon, I bypassed my host family, went right into my room, locked the door, and laid on the bed. I had never been so physically and emotionally exhausted in my entire life. I felt guilty because I had trouble explaining to my family why I had chosen this type of work, and I was afraid it would always remain a mystery to them. I also felt guilty because I knew that in three months' time, I could return to the United States and resume my life with hot showers, with a loving and supportive family and friends, and regaining a sense of normalcy. I thought to myself, how can I do this for the next 10 weeks, let alone for the rest of my life? The stories and the testimonies I heard were always with me, and sometimes they terrorized me. But when I emerged from my room, and I saw my host family's faces, and I saw my godson, Rafi, pulling on my pajama pant leg, looking for a hug, calon, a hug, I said, this is my life's work. The experience is worth the effort. 
And in that moment, my faith in my ability to do this work well for the long term was restored. Research shows that survivors have a psychological need for validation of the harms they suffered. After conflict, normal relationships and trust relationships are broken, and these relationships take time and energy in order to rebuild. Public validation also shows survivors their place in society and that their experiences with genocide matter to those in the new community. In addition, there must be guarantees of non-repetition that these atrocities won't happen again. My interviews in Rwanda have taught me that validation is essential to justice because when the court cases close and the tribunal's mandate ends, all that's left are those who suffered the genocide and those who are willing to help them recover. These stories show how Rwandans are living a form of justice that we may never even think about. I urge us to expand our perceptions of justice because the paradigm in which we live of legal justice that focuses on court cases, on punishment, and on ordinary crimes doesn't fit the bill when it comes to extraordinary crimes like genocide and mass violence. For every interview, interviewee, I ask them, what does justice mean for you? And with every interviewee, there was a different answer. And this is why I know from my research we must expand our perceptions of justice and be more inclusive about those things that can bring people empathy and love and validation and truly make them feel whole again. Each of us has the power to provide a sense of justice for victims and survivors of any kind of violence. Genocide and identity-based violence may seem like problems that happen to those people over there, but we know people who have experienced violence in our lives. Those people are close to our hearts. And when we hear what's happened to them, we are heartbroken. Therefore, we must put ourselves in the survivor's shoes just for a minute. And by documenting their stories, by making sure survivors are not further marginalized by our policies and programs, and by validating their experiences, we can be part of the solution. We've all seen the face of injustice, and therefore we can be the face of future justice. Genocide, memory, and justice do not have a concrete ending. Rather, they have a lasting impact. If we expand our perceptions of justice and truly listen to those who have been marginalized, then the hopes and aspirations that we all have of unity and peace can become a reality. Thank you.